don't bring me no bad news. Markets shrug off higher consumer prices and even a vaccination program put on hold as they see a glass more than half full. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, contributors Larry Summers of Harvard. Over the next decade, I think we've got more to fear from microbes than we do from Xi Jinping. And former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano. Bank of America Chairman and CEO Brian Moynihan. Our loans fell because largely because people are paying us off because they have so much cash sitting around. Nancy Davis of Quadratic Capital. I don't know why people wouldn't have uh, inflation in their portfolio. And Laird Landman of TCW. If investors were looking for something to shake their confidence, this might have been the week for it. Consumer price numbers rose substantially, more than was expected, and we're not done yet. We are really focused on the progress of the economy toward those goals and not on a particular time frame. And if fears of inflation weren't enough, the CDC and FDA suddenly announced that we should stop vaccinating people with the Johnson & Johnson coronavirus vaccine, at least until they figure out what's going on with a handful of very serious cases of blood clots. That's why you see the word pause. In other words, you want to hold off for a bit and very well may go back to that, maybe with some conditions or maybe not. But the markets, the markets took it all in stride with the banks posting earnings no one could have dreamed of just a year ago and the S&P and Dow and NASDAQ 100 all reaching new record highs. Even the U.S. Treasury 10-year barely blinked on the J&J &J news with the yield ticking up only for a moment and then turning around and dropping the most since February. To help us understand the market reaction, or maybe lack of reaction, we're joined now by our Wall Street Week roundtable of Nancy Davis, Chief Investment Officer at Quadratic Capital, and also Laird Landman. He is a Portfolio Manager for Fixed Income at TCW. So welcome, both of you. Laird, let me start with you. Uh, you are a fixed income guy. One of the big questions, I think, on investors' minds right now is inflation. Is it transitory, as Jay Powell tells us, or could it be more troubling than that? If you look at the fixed income market, what do you look at to answer that question? Well, I think it's very hard to know what to look at. In the 60s, people looked at the Phillips curve. In the 70s, the theory of, mon of inflation was that it was monetary in all places. You looked at M M2 growth. Um, in, the, in the 90s, it was P star. There's been all different models and none of them have really worked. Um, today, we're, in a, we're clearly moved into a direction of uh, this, this modern monetary theory. One of my favorite charts you can pull up uh, on your terminal is just just chart uh, the budget deficit versus the growth in the Fed balance sheet. It's a one for one sort of item. So if anyone thinks we're not in modern monetary policy world, uh, take a hard look at that. Um, and I think that given that, it's, it's gonna be very difficult to know whether inflation is going to be real or transitory. But as we increase the amount of government spending going on, and as we move from the government transferring money to individuals to actually spending the money themselves, uh, I believe the price elasticities will become will change and you'll actually see more persistent inflation. So that's something we're focused on is the idea that government spending does tend to be subject to more inflationary pressures. And they will also crowd out as they do infrastructure. They're going to crowd out traditional commodities like copper, lumber, steel. So, uh, Nancy, you actually try to hedge against inflation with your IVOL ETF. Uh, give us a sense of what you look at on inflation, because in addition to what Laird said, for example, you look at money supply. And, and I mean, like M2, I think, has increased by more than 25 percent year over year. I mean, if you if you look at the data and you look at what's happening in reality between the Fed having an average inflation target, between uh, having fiscal spending, between having the Fed not even thinking about thinking about raising rates, um, and uh, a blue wave right now, and relative to the rest of the world, really exporting inflation now from emerging market companies and uh, countries, I I don't know why people wouldn't have uh, inflation in their portfolio. To me, it's sort of like why would you why would you take a risk and take a bet? To me. Um, inflation is actually a bigger risk to investors than a recession, because if you think about what, you know, not, not, not healthy normal inflation, but if we had runaway inflation, 
that would uh, decrease our purchasing power, right? Um, the cost of drugs, the cost of housing, the cost of travel, especially if we have a weaker dollar. Um, to me, I don't see why people are thinking or overthinking it. I think you should just have a diversified portfolio. And just because we haven't had runaway inflation for many years, doesn't mean we're not going to have it in the future. Uh, so, so Laird, assuming for a moment that there is a significant risk, one that an investor needs to take into account of inflation, what do you do? I mean, when I think of fixed income, you're an expert, I'm not, but I think uh, inflation is not necessarily good for bond values. Uh, yeah, we, I, we would love to argue our asset class here. We would always love to argue it, but I think our fiduciary responsibility says that, you know, looking for high returns from fixed income in this environment is probably, you know, the, there will be areas of the fixed income markets that can generate high returns, but in general, uh, I think you have to be concerned that rates could go higher here before the Fed kind of wakes up and goes from thinking about thinking about to thinking about uh, at some point actually taking action. Um, if you're going to protect yourself, I think you look to, you know, what is the government going to crowd out? Where are the price elasticities uh, going to become um, um, very sensitive. Um, and I think you look at copper and I think you look at some of the industrial metals and I think you look at lumber and you look at where the housing market is today. And, and you know, there's a story this morning that supply in Greenwich is down 44 uh, percent for houses. Um, there's going to be building in the private sector. There's going to be building in the public sector. Um, and I think you position yourself uh, to benefit from that. So, Nancy, from your point of view, because this is really what you do, how do you hedge for inflation? You have your eyeball ETF. That's one alternative, I assume. What do you recommend in terms of hedging for the possibility of inflation? Well, I know a lot of people look at commodities, you know, as Laird was pointing out, and I know a lot of people look at some equities and some sectors in the markets. To me, um, and what we do with eyeball, is we look at the interest rate market. Um, that to me seems like a very simple way of saying, where do lenders lend money, right? The different levels of, of interest rates around the world. And we use the um, over-the-counter swaps market, which is, you know, there are lots of different rates in the U.S. dollar. Um, Fed funds is one. Uh, you know, you have LIBOR, you have treasury rates. The OTC swaps market is where global bond issuers, right? When AstraZeneca needs to raise money or when Sony needs to raise money or any um, issuer around the world, any corporate, they hedge their uh, bond risk in the rates market. Thank you so much for our Wall Street Week roundtable of Laird Landman from TCW and Nancy Davis from Quadratic Capital. Coming up, how the economy looks from the top of one of America's leading banks. We talk with Brian Moynihan of Bank of America. Consumers in good shape, but by and large, a big portion of the economy is up and operating very well. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. The Federal Reserve can put money into the system um, by increasing the money supply, but if banks are unwilling to lend it to corporations because they're afraid of bad loans and risky loans and write-offs, then the private economy will suffer. That was PIMCO's Bill Gross on Wall Street Week back in 1990. This week, bank lending was back in the news again as the banks posted eye-popping numbers despite sluggish loan growth. As in 1990, the Federal Reserve has done its part in putting money into the system, but this time, it's not because the banks are reluctant to lend. No, this time, it's that the government's given a lot of money to households that have used it to pay off debt, leaving less reason to borrow. We talked with the head of one of the biggest lenders in the country. He's Brian Moynihan of Bank of America. And we asked him what this says about the economy going forward. A big part of the economy, and I think you know, our prediction is that for the economy to cross over in the next couple quarters to be bigger than it was before the pandemic, is, is open and operating, and the consumers are spending money, and that's very good news. And then when you translate to Bank of America, what you're seeing is our deposits are way up because that money went into people's accounts and it's sitting there. But our loans are, are not as high, you know, fell because largely because people are paying us off because they have so much cash sitting around. So now the commercial side, we expect that to change the economy growing at 7%, which is what we predict will require companies to borrow to service that economy. It's just that con companies had a lot of cash too. So we look for more loan growth as the year progresses. But the good news is the, c the consumers in good shape, 
There's an unemployment issue. We've got to get that the rest of the way down to where it should be. The business has got to get open. It couldn't be. But by and large, a big portion of the economy is up and operating very well. Bank of America has a very special viewpoint into the American economy because you have such a consumer, such a retail presence, and also the middle market. You really deal with small and medium-sized enterprises across the country. Are you seeing any pickup in the borrowing from your medium-sized companies yet? It, we've seen it bump along the bottom. Usage of our business banking segment, which is 50 million and under revenue companies in our middle market, which is 2.5 billion, we're seeing the line usage rel pretty flat. But the good news is it quit going down. We saw in the months during the quarter, January, February, March, it got a little stronger. Uh, our origination activity, meaning uh, you know, new clients and new deals done, is, still, is strong, bodes well for the, for the year. But, but we've got to see it come through. Um, and that goes back to those companies having a lot of cash and had to run very efficiently during the crisis because you didn't know what happened next. And, in t and, and now they're going to be you need to start spending money on supplies and things to re redo their inventory. Now, the one thing I think we all have to be mindful of is we've got to get the trade. The trade is growing fast out of, you know, into the country, but the ports and things still need to get straightened out because of just the dynamics of the virus and the supply chains are still ironing out. So I think one of the things I worry about for mid-sized companies, can they get the supplies to do, do what they do? So you've heard about lumber prices or resin and things like that. I think it'll straighten out. We hope it'll straighten out. But that's the next sort of challenge. Outside the health care, the next challenge is to get the supply chains really up and oiled and greased and running through to serve that fast-growing economy. So if that is the consumer and the retail side, talk about the investment bank, the other side of your business here. You put up some very big numbers this morning. Can you make up for any shortfall on the retail side from what you're doing in investment banking? And what are you doing to do that? Well, it, you know, the investment banking fees year over year up for 50 percent or something like that, $2 billion plus, terrific. The trading group had, under Jimmy DeMar's leadership, had, had working for Tom Montag, you know, had $5 billion plus of revenue. Matthew Coder in the, in the investment banking side had a great quarter. The activity still seems to be strong in terms of the investment bank, and hopefully that bodes well, carries in the second quarter. Trading always goes, settles down as you go through the year. It's just the way it works, but there's, there's enough activity. So, you know, I, those made up for it. Now, the question is, now you'll see more roll through from the other sides of the house because they had to put up big provisions last year because of the worry about credit. That's gone, and they're taking credits back, and that the deposit base grew, and we can put it to work and finally earn some money. So as the investment bank activity could stay strong because lots of M&A activity has to take place. But, you know, if the markets settle down a little bit, that's fine because they've had such a great year. The other parts will roll through and make up for it. But we made $8 billion on you know, uh, $23 billion of revenue, and that's not a bad quarter. Uh, let's talk about yields. Uh, the yields have been pushing up on fixed income, uh, despite the fact that this week actually we had a downturn that may be a flip, flip or not. But it's really important to Bank of America, given the way your business works, what the 10-year yield on this Treasury is and what the yield curve is, the spread between the twos and the tens. Uh, what are you projecting for the rest of the year? Many people think the yields are just going to keep marching up. Well, we are all projecting that. And so we're up over uh, the 10-year got up to 170 you know, plus and now it's back to 155 today, one of the reasons why the bank, uh, you know, companies like ours, you know, took it on the chin a little bit. But that's transient. It'll move back and forth, and there were some reasons for that happening today, I'm told. But we'll see what happens tomorrow. But the reality is, if the economic activity is picking up and, and prices are picking up, which you've seen, unemployment's going down, you know, it, uh, the yield curve will start to normalize. And you saw that start to happen as we came in out of last year, fourth quarter into first quarter. That helps us because as the curve gets higher, it, we can make more money from the loans and other things we do. Now, what's really important to us, honestly, is, is short rates. And the question is, when the Fed raises rates, the market has it uh, pretty well deferred. And they've been clear that they want to see the inflation levels they've, uh, Chair Powell's talked about. They want to see the unemployment numbers. And they've been clear about that. The question is whether it will happen faster than they, see, they have in their projections, as they, even they have projections at 6 percent plus for GDP growth this year. And so we'll see when those rates, but that's the that's the quicker route to success for us because we have all we have all these no interest bearing deposits that instantaneously are worth more that we don't have to do any more work. So I was going to ask you about risks actually because right now it looks like things are going gangbusters for Bank of America and some of the other big banks. Uh, what do you look at as risks? Is one of the risks the possibility that in fact the Fed may have to move sooner than the markets think because there are some people who are saying that they will. Well. The question is, why do they have to move? They have to move because the growth is strong and they, they're comfortable. The inflation view uh, will hold. They, you know, remember, they changed their monetary policy to do an average of inflation, and, and it, it's the first time we had you know, a chance to put that to work. So I think if they're raising rates because the economy is strong and because the, they, the uh, inflation 
uh, outlook, everything is is, is higher it, it, than their targets. You know, that's a, that's not a bad thing. If they're raising because inflation and other things got out of control and wasn't temporary, that's probably not a good thing. So, you know, it really the question of raising rates is a risk in certain circumstances and an extreme benefit in others just because it means the economy is normalizing. I want to ask one question about crypto because it's come up quite a bit. I mean, you and I have talked before about Bitcoin. You always say it's not Bitcoin, it's blockchain, it's distributed ledger. At the same time, we had the chairman of the Fed uh, talk to us uh, just this week and say, you know, it's not cryptocurrency, it's crypto assets that you speculate about. How do you see the dynamic from Bitcoin on the one hand to cryptocurrency of any sort of the other to perhaps a central bank digital currency? Where is this going? Well, I think there are multiple facets. Obviously, as an asset people are investing in, you know, our clients are asking us, can we invest in this asset and you know, put it in our accounts and look at it? And that's, those are issues we have to, to consider. And you're seeing... You know, some of our colleagues uh, start to do formal custody, and you've seen those announcements and things like that, which will enable us to do some things. And so that, that's the investment side, and that's for large institutions and, you know, affluent investors and, and people looking at it. Then you have the transactional side, and the question of moving money digitally is not new. More than, I think, probably 55, 60 percent of our consumer money moved digitally this last quarter, and on the commercial side, it's probably 97 percent. It all moves digitally, very little paper uh, movement. So the idea of moving money digitally, uh, think about uh, um, Zelle and the volumes going through that now and the number of users, not only in our company, but in the industry total, that's not a new concept. Then the question is, you know, an anonymous currency or currency that doesn't have attribution, that's a different question. And I think uh, uh, you've heard uh, Chair Powell and, and Secretary of uh, Treasuries in the past reflect on that. That's a different question. A central bank, central bank digital currency, you know, is just, we already, in any way, we already have that. We have a bunch of accounts with them. They're ones and zeros. We know where they are. There's a huge amount of money represented by it. So the idea of making it available more, more granular, I think we'll see what they decide to do and we'll react to it. But the reality is we make money movement digitally is the dominant way money moves in our franchise today and it will be in the future. Brian, you've always prided yourself not only on being able to control costs, but also control risk, manage risk. You talk about responsible growth for Bank of America. We've had some instances in the recent past of some other banks that have raised questions about managing risk. I'm talk talking, of course, about Archegos. Uh, I understand from your chief financial officer that you weren't involved in that. But, but knowing you, when you first heard about that, did you ask Tom Montag, others, to say, do we have any exposure not just to Archegos, not just to that one, but to other similar ones? How do you know that you don't have that kind of risk? Well, that's, that's a case. But every one of these cases, whether it's operational things that happen or, or in that case, uh, a lending arrangement, uh, a, a prime brokerage type arrangement that, go, that goes awry, whatever the case is, we, we're, look, we don't think we have all the answers at all. We, we, we immediately say, could that have happened here? How do we know it didn't happen here? Let's go double check. Let's recheck all our systems and make sure, et cetera, cybersecurity attack, whatever the case is. And that, so one of the ways you have to, you know, you have to be curious. You have to ask a question. If you think, whether it's even on the competitive side, new products, new services, what's out there, what do customers need, you have to be curious, but also on the risk side. And Jeff Green, our chief risk officer, along with Tom and Jimmy DeMar and, and the team in the lending side, a fellow named Robert Schleicher and Bruce Thompson and Mick Ankrum, these guys, you know, this, this team and, and, and Cheryl Boucher and this team is just very good at understanding risk. And so sometimes the opportunity is that you, you take it, sometimes you don't. But, it, but whenever anything happens, you've got to go in and look and say, OK, let's not act like we're too smart. Let's not think we're too smart. Let's doubt. Let's have serious doubt about how good we are and go look at it and confirm that it didn't happen instead of saying it couldn't have happened because. And that's the way you run good risk management. Coming up, we'll have more with Brian Moynihan at Bank of America. A year ago, he sent tens of thousands of employees to work from home overnight. Now the question is, when will he bring them back, and does he need to? We're a work from office company because of productivity and the culture and the, and the mentoring that can take place is just, is just better. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. Bank of America had to switch nearly all of its operations to work from home overnight when the pandemic struck a year ago. It managed it, but at a cost, both financial and interpersonal. Now the question is, when will it be time to bring them back? And do all of them need to return to the office? 
we return to our conversation with Bank of America Chairman and CEO, Brian Moynihan. Our teammates want to work, and, and we're a work from office company because of productivity and the culture and the, and the mentoring that can take place is just, is just better. Now, maybe that changes over another couple of decades. Maybe if we were in this condition for a decade, we'd have to adjust. But, you know, in the end of the day, you know, we already saying to people, you got to get, you know, you get your vaccines. We get half the people in the office vaccinated. You can open the office. And we're having people trying to get through that window, you know, in some of the field office and stuff. So we're, you know, we're, we're letting people make their decisions. We're encouraging them. We're showing them lots of data. We're trying to get appointments for our team and things like that so they can get back to work. And then we're a work from office company. Now, we are already in the mode of high performing work places and sort of uh, hoteling office and all the different discussion. We, we think people will think about commuting differently. I always tell the story that we had, you know, our built big buildings in Midtown, uh, one Bryant Park, and we're doing a building across the street. And when we ask people to move to Jersey City or something like that, they might, or hope well, they might think, oh my gosh, you're sending me to Outer Mongolia or something like that. You know, the reality is they, they now have gone from home and they're much more adaptable. Well, I'll commute in the city a couple of days, I'll commute, you know, to Jersey City or I'll go to Hopewell. So we have to think about our real estate configuration and retool it. In the end of the day, 10 years ago, we had 130 million square feet of real estate for Bank of America. Today, we have about 70. And so we can just keep making that real estate more efficient and, and more dedicated team, better real estate for our teammates to work in and then work with them on their personal decisions. But at the end of the day, we have found in our work from office strategies, or work from home strategies, which we've had for years, that you know certain types of jobs and certain types of activity are better served. And we have about 20,000 people working from home before the pandemic, but it, but it has to be a certain type of job and a certain activity. And we'll we'll see how that plays out. But my big expectation is after after Labor Day, we'll you know we'll be back to you know, generally moving towards uh, being back to normal. Between now and then, it'll be partial. But the key is. Then you flip it for the good of cities and towns and stuff. We, you know, as those people who are vaccinated come back to work and go to restaurants, that'll just be good for the vibrancy of downtown. So in Charlotte, you know, I was talking to another CEO today. They, you know, we need to get the people commuting downtown, and and then the restaurants and downtown life can come back. Which in great cities need that. You've got a lot of real estate in Boston and in New York and in Charlotte. Are you going to have more in Florida? Because we're seeing a fair number of financial institutions are moving south. Is that on the is that on the table for Bank of America? Uh, not, not really. We would, you know, our operations are pretty well sited, sited where they are. And by the way, we have a big, a lot of people in Florida and a lot of people in Jacksonville and places like that, that the big operation centers for years. Brian, just one quick one here at the end, if you can. Was it hard to decide to sign on to that level about the Georgia voting law? Because you signed with a lot of other companies protesting what's going on. Yeah, and our teammates and our, and our customers and our teammates and others are saying, wait a second, this, you know, we think this is something we have to make it clear that we stand for the principles of a, of a, a right to vote and we shouldn't infringe upon that. And that's a statement that was uh, from the weekend or earlier this week. And, you know, look at the list of people. You know, those are people that fall on all different, you know, political sides and things like that. This is a, about what America is all about. That was Brian Moynihan, chairman and CEO of Bank of America. Coming up, dealing with high tech, one problem that the United States and China have in common. And former IBM CEO Sam Palmasano sees the differences and the similarities. If you are operating in China, you need to maintain a close relationship and partnership with the government. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Big Brother is going after Jack Ma's tech empire. As part of a string of crackdowns, Beijing imposed a record $2.8 billion fine on Alibaba for abusing its market dominance and ordered it to stop making merchants choose between Alibaba and competing platforms. With this penalty decision, we've received a, a good guidance on some of the specific issues under the uh, anti-monopoly law. China also ordered an overhaul of Ant Group, which has expanded into payments, banking, wealth management, and insurance over the years. I don't think the government wants this story to dominate through 2021. And specifically, they've been guiding media to report on how um, they, the government is pro what they call platform economy. They are pro the innovation. 
The revamp leaves Ant's main businesses intact, but the new directive makes it harder for the firm to direct traffic from its payment service, Alipay, which has a billion users, to other Ant financial services including wealth management, consumer lending, and even on-demand neighborhood services and delivery. Now philosophy is simple. If you carry out similar activities, similar risks as a bank, then you're subject to similar rules and similar requirements. This week, Chinese regulators also summoned 34 of the country's largest tech companies, from Tencent to TikTok owner ByteDance, warning them to curb their excesses, joining a global rush by governments to regulate big tech. Globally, uh, the trend is that regulators will be more keen to look at uh, some of the areas where uh, you, you could have uh, unfair competition. Sam Palmasano knows what it is to run a tech giant the government wants to regulate. From his time as CEO of IBM, when the U.S. government and the European Commission were both pursuing IBM, we asked him to evaluate the Chinese moves to restrict big tech and how they compare with U.S. efforts. If you go back in the early stages of technology or in emerging economic opportunities, if we do it broadly, governments always try to provide incentives or clear a path for companies. And that started really in fintech in China. And basically, you know, I was over there a lot when I was working. And it was clear from the central banking system that they wanted to be able to get more liquidity going to small businesses. And the state-owned enterprise banks were really focused on mid-sized to large companies. So they gave uh, a lot of flexibility in the regulations to let these guys get going. And they did a phenomenal job. They get really big. And once they get really big, the government decides that we need to bring them back into the banking system and therefore create the holding company and subject them to more regulation. And at the same time, it really struck me that after there was that record fine uh, imposed against Alibaba, Alibaba thanked the regulators for the fine. I don't remember IBM back in your day thanking the federal government for, for suing them. <laughs> well, you know, we, we uh, as I used to say uh, when I was a CEO, I'm elected every year by the uh, shareholders. Uh, so it's a different system, you know, here versus there. Uh, but I really mean, I mean, I could see that why if you are operating in China, you need to maintain a close relationship and partnership with the government because they can impact your business either positively and negatively in a very direct way, in a very quick and direct way. Does that suggest that China may have an easier time, if you can call it easy, uh, really getting their control over the big tech companies in China because of that different relationship than, for example, Washington would have with the big tech here in the United States? When you think about it, you know, it's not, it, it's not, a, it's not a, a split government of any way. It's a centralized government in complete control. So if Xi Jinping decides he, does, he wants to stop an IPO of Ant, he just stops the IPO of Ant, you know, right? They don't have to go through the process. There's not checks and balances and those sorts of things. So therefore, the government does have a lot of control. And in a lot of, in a lot of the early stage government, companies, I should say, governments are actually active shareholders in those companies. Uh, and over time, they divest, and sometimes they don't. An example would be Lenovo, what we did with uh, selling the PC business to Lenovo. But at the early stage of that relationship, the Chinese government had about 25% share of Lenovo. Now, they've divested over time, but nonetheless, that, that they come in and out of companies. At the same time, uh, President Xi has made it very clear he wants to compete on the world stage when it comes to tech. He's made that a priority of his. Does he have to be somewhat concerned about going too far in really uh, curtailing big tech in China because it, it won't be as competitive with, for example, the United States? The key is he needs innovation, right? And there's a lot of the areas that they don't have the same expertise and experience in. Take entrepreneurship. I mean, there are a lot of great entrepreneurs in China but not necessarily in tech in China. So therefore, there's going to be a uh, encouragement, by, I believe, by the Chinese government for foreign investment in entrepreneurial endeavors, even though in other places they're trying to control foreign investment. Uh, so you'll see this sort of almost like it's uh, a split perspective or split uh, interactions. Some areas are going to say they want uh, indigenous innovation, but they need foreign help. Uh, and that's how they'll pursue it, in my opinion. Uh, look at Hong Kong, for example. They're getting more control of Hong Kong, but they're putting tax incentives to attract hedge funds and wealthy people to Hong Kong. So you would say, isn't that, aren't they a counter, counter interest of each other, the communist system of socialism versus attracting hedge funds and large wealthy people? Well, they're very pragmatic, you know, and depending upon their goals, they will adjust.
The other big issue this week when it comes to tech was supply chains. As we saw this virtual meeting at the White House, President Biden himself appeared for a time. There's a big chip shortage right now the United States is suffering from. Uh, what is the right answer on supply chain and how different is the U.S. situation on supply chains from that in China? Well, they're quite different, but basically there's a worldwide constraint at this point in time over chips. Uh, it's driven by some factors pandemic clearly being one of them, demand shifts being the other. I, there's been much more movement into traditional IT PCs at home than there would have been without a pandemic as students learning in the house, entertainment in the house, et cetera, et cetera. So those two things combined cause a big demand shift, which the industry has missed. But the industry on the manufacturing side, which are called fabs, fabricators, uh, is very concentrated. There are two or three big players, and there's, most of them are in Asia. In Taiwan, in Korea, they're in Asia. You know, right? There's still some in the United States. There's very few in Europe, but they're predominantly in Asia. Those big companies. So, having said all that, right? You have an issue of concentration as a supply problem, which the companies are going to have to address, right? Which is basically how do they create alternative sources of supply to, so they don't run into these situations again? And they might create their own little fabs. They might form consortiums. That'll all be adjusted. It's going to take time to get through this because fabs are very capital intensive. Having said that, a government's going to have a different view of this. The government's going to view, hey, strategically, I need to get control over these this manufacturing capability. I need to bring it back home. It's almost like strategic oil reserves, if I can make that analogy. They're going to have a core group of these kinds of companies housed within their domicile in their countries so they can keep control of a secure supply chain, especially when it comes to national security. What about China with respect to microchip supply? Do they have a similar problem, constraint, in being able to get access to microchips? There's a, there's a more complicated. It's not just access, it's the technology. Right now, China, their semiconductor infrastructure is about two generations behind the current infrastructure. Now, that can be appropriate for a lot of use cases, I mean, vehicles and those sorts of things. It's not appropriate for really pushing the edge of technology where they would want to push for national defense. Networks, high-speed networks, 5G, visual recognition, those sorts of things, right? That's, a, that's the latest technology. They're behind. So their challenge is two. One is how do I get it on shore? And the other is how do I get these strategic technologies or how do I learn quickly enough to catch up to the rest of the world? They're investing vast amounts of money to do those things. I think so it's picked over there, but they, they're investing vast amounts of money into those companies to go create that infrastructure. They've been at it for a long time, by the way, David, and this is not new. It just takes a long time to catch up because technology keeps moving forward. That was Wall Street Week contributor Sam Palmisano. Coming up, we take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. It's time now to take a look at the week ahead on Global Wall Street. Thanks, David. Well, after the record China GDP numbers, we'll get a clearer read on the country's consumer-led rebound and green push when China's biggest car show opens its doors in Shanghai. Meanwhile, over in Hainan at the annual Bauer Forum, we'll hear from world leaders and central bankers such as the PBOC Governor Yi Gang, the IMF's Kristalina Georgieva and AIIB President Jin Li Chung. We're also focused on the reopening story and we'll have the much anticipated trip IPO in Hong Kong. While on Monday, Australia and New Zealand open up their borders in what's believed to be the first travel bubble of its kind. We'll also see if gamers are heading back to Macau when March visitor arrivals are released Thursday. Danny? Thanks, Juliet. We have the ECB decision this coming Thursday where we're expecting policymakers to sound cautiously optimistic, especially as Europe races to vaccinate the population. With that in mind, any updates on the AstraZeneca and J&J &J vaccines where concerns about rare blood clots have been raised will be closely watched. Romaine? Thank you, Danny. Earnings season revving up here in the U.S. About 80 of the S&P 500 companies scheduled to report. That includes Coca-Cola and United Airlines on Monday, Netflix on Tuesday, Verizon and Chipotle on Wednesday, and then Intel, Honeywell, and American Express round out the week. On the economic front, we get the latest data for monthly home sales, as well as the PMI readings for the manufacturing and services industries. And two important meetings in Washington near the end of the week. 
President Joe Biden preparing to host 40 world leaders for a virtual summit on climate change, and a CDC advisory committee is set to reconvene to discuss the safety of the J&J COVID vaccine shot. David? Thanks to Juliet, Danny, and Romaine. Coming up, we wrap up the week with special Wall Street Week contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. And as we do every week, we're going to wrap up the week with our special contributor. He is Larry Summers of Harvard. Larry, welcome back. Great to have you here. Let's talk about inflation. We have talked about it on this program. You've talked about it elsewhere quite a few times. But this week, this week, we had the Council of Economic Advisors put out a blog post, a fairly long essay that I'm not sure, but I think it might have been responding to you. They think we don't have a long-term problem. What do you say? I read the CEA analysis pretty carefully. I can't say it put my mind at ease. Here are some things it didn't talk about. Didn't talk about the housing market on fire more than any time since the statistics were being created. Didn't talk about all the employers who reported that they were having difficulty finding uh, labor or the fact that the vacancy rate is already back to uh, normal levels. Didn't talk about the purchasing manager surveys which show things uh, to be in unprecedented uh, territory. Didn't talk about the largest one-quarter movement upwards in 10-year bond yields in uh, decades. It didn't talk about the consequences for inflation psychology of a change in the policy regime away from preempting inflation towards uh, preempting the idea of doing something about uh, inflation. It argued that there was going to be a variety of transient factors that would lead to high inflation uh, now. It's right about that, but that's a little bit like arguing that we're about to have a blizzard, but that doesn't mean anybody should worry about how bad the winter uh, is uh, going to be. So there are no certainties. and. God knows economists aren't very good at forecasting uh, inflation. But if you look at the overheating economy theory of inflation, it looks like we're headed towards an overheating economy. If you look at the monetarist theory of inflation, money aggregates are growing at unprecedented rates. If you look at the fiscal theory of inflation, we're in an unprecedented uh, fiscal uh, experiment. So. It certainly didn't convince me uh, that one should be relaxed about inflation. And, David, I have to say that the frequency with which people return to this argument and debate suggests to me that there is a certain amount of uh, discomfort and uh, concern uh, out there. But we'll see what happens. And I don't think we'll know yeah. uh, for. 18 months uh, or so, uh, what the uh, consequences of the experiment we're engaged in are. But so far, uh, nothing's happened that has given me any reassurance. And if anything, the flow of the numbers has uh, been more rapid than I would have uh, expected and more cause for concern. Yeah, it certainly looks like you've hit a sore, sore spot there. You know, there's a lot of reaction to what you had to say. At the same time, we also hear from Federal Reserve officials, including Jay Powell, the chairman, and he keeps coming back to a point that they do make in the Council of Economic Advisors uh, uh, essay, which is there are long-term, at least decade-long forces that are large headwinds against inflation. Those include an aging population, they include technology, they include globalization. Will that keep us away from an unmoored inflation? Maybe, uh, but those kinds of structural forces have more to do with the level of prices than they do with uh, the rate of uh, inflation. It's the basic law of economics that when things are in short supply, they tend to go up in price and to go up in price more rapidly the shorter the supply is. And if you look at it, whether it's houses or silicon chips or restaurant uh, workers 
or skilled managers, there are more and more things headed for very short uh, supply. And I think that's going to make uh, their prices uh, and wages uh, go up. And I don't see why Jay's uh, structural factors uh, change uh, that basic uh, logic. It may take a little longer. The timing may be um, a little bit uh, different. But, you know, for the first time, David, um, in since they started collecting the statistics, a majority of American homes that sell are selling above the asking price. That's got to be telling you that asking prices are about to soar. Now, we use a price index that doesn't pay attention to the price of houses in calculating the price of living in owner-occupied housing, believe it or not. We've got some formula involving owners something called owner's equivalent rental. But from a common sense point of view, the idea that housing is dragging down inflation surely must seem absurd to most Americans. And it can't be the way it's going to be for a very long time, given what we're seeing. Larry, let's talk about growth. Uh, we've long heard about how delightful it is to have global synchronized growth. Right now, it doesn't look like we're headed there. We have asynchronous growth. We certainly have China doing quite well. The United States apparently is headed, for at least for a year or so, into pretty robust growth. On the other hand, Europe seems to be lagging behind. And then don't even get me started about some of the emerging markets. They seem to be really suffering quite a bit. What are the risks in that kind of uh, uh, asymmetry in the global economy? You know, to paraphrase, <laughs> paraphrase uh, Dickens, we may be headed for a tale of two worlds between the U.S. and China on the one hand and large parts of the developing world on uh, the other. I heard a debate the other day, and it's the most depressing debate I've heard in a long time, about whether when you look at Latin America and Africa and even parts of India, you're going to be looking at a lost decade or you're going to be looking at a lost uh, generation. We just have not seen remotely the kind of boldness and imagination that we've seen in responding to this with monetary and fiscal policy for the rich countries like the United States in some of the poorest countries. And to have that kind of effort requires the international system to step up. And so far, it's really stepped up in a rather inadequate way. I think this is going to have huge political consequences for our security, not to mention the tragic consequences for millions, if not uh, 10 millions, of uh, people. At the same time, I can hear in my head some people up on Capitol Hill, I will say they tend to be Republicans, maybe not exclusively, who say, why is that our problem? You heard that in some of the exchanges with Janet Yellen, the Secretary of Treasury, actually, over the SDR, the Special Drawing Rights Contest about the IMF, which basically, why are we helping out the rest of the world? This is not a charitable endeavor. This is forward defense of our global interests. And look, I'm... I'm as worried as anybody about uh, China. I'm as worried about anybody as Russia. But frankly, over the next decade, I think we've got more to fear from microbes than we do from Xi Jinping. So let's wrap up this week with a lightning round here, as Summer says. N number one, let me ask you, uh, do you think that we'll have a 10-year yield at 3 percent before we get down to 4 percent on the unemployment number? It's a race. My guess is we'll get to the 4 percent unemployment rate first, because we'll get to it this year. Uh, and secondly, there's a lot of talk about in inequality, income and wealth inequality in this country. It's been great and growing for some time. A lot of people say we have to fix it, including Jay Powell at the Federal Reserve. If you're going to really address that issue, can you do it through fiscal policy or other means, or do you need labor law reform, such as President Biden is trying to implement? I hesitate ever to use the word need, but I'll say this. We sure could use uh, labor law reform uh, in uh, this country. I think it's something where 
we Democrats have not been aggressive enough uh, for a long time. The impunity with which employers can break up union organizing efforts and fire union organizers with only a slap on the wrist is a national embarrassment, and it is something that should be changed uh, very quickly. And finally, Larry, you, of course, were Secretary of Treasury. Toward the end of the week on Thursday, we heard from the United States government they're going to impose new sanctions on Russia for that solar wind uh, hack as well as for interference in the election. And part of the sanctions were really specifically on Russian sovereign debt. From your experience, is that a gesture or could it actually change Russian behavior? How effective is that sort of sanction? I think it has some impact, but it's easier to be critical of sanctions than it is to identify an alternative. When countries do things that are sufficiently wrong from our viewpoint, and we don't and we want to do more than talk, and God knows we don't want to do anything violent, there's a tendency for policy to go to sanctions, and it's probably the best of bad alternatives. Okay, thank you so very much to our Wall Street Week special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard University. Finally, one more thought. Bernie Madoff. This week, Wall Street lost one of its most infamous villains. We all know the story, the man who spent decades building an investment fund that didn't invest, who told his 4,800 investors they were worth $65 billion that wasn't there, who took advantage of the rich and the famous and the not so rich and the not so famous, his close friends, and even the endowment of the Orthodox University whose board he chaired. This week, Bernie Madoff died in prison, like Charles Ponzi did 70 years ago, the man who gave his name to the scheme Madoff copied and then took to a scale no one could have imagined. This was a multi-decade uh, Ponzi scheme, which was unusual in its, uh, he never bought a single share of stock, he never bought any options. When something as big and as bad as Bernie Madoff's crime happens, we all look for some larger meaning. Does it show us that we're all gullible, that we're all greedy, that we are all too willing to wish ourselves to success even when it's too good to be true? Does it tell us that no matter how much we may regulate, we can never regulate our way to integrity? Or maybe, just maybe, it's an important reminder that there are some people who are out there who, and there is no other word for it, have evil in their heart. But they're rare, and the willingness of the rest of us to trust, despite knowing they are out there, is what makes it all work in the end, isn't it? That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.